evening. My name is Sarah Abravias Stein, and I am a professor of modern Jewish history in the Department of History of the Jewish Studies program in the Jackson School. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third of this year's Samuel and Althea Strom lecture series, Sephardi Jewries and the Holocaust, delivered by Dr. Aaron Rodrigue, Eva Chernov Loki, professor in Jewish studies and professor of history at Stanford University. In the first two of this year's Strom lectures, we have witnessed Dr. Rodrigue's staggering erudition in the history of modern Jewries, the Ottoman, Levantine, and Balkan worlds, the Holocaust, and perhaps most of all, Judeo-Spanish culture. Any audience engaged in these issues would devour these lectures, reveling in Dr. Rodrigue's ability to weave into one graceful tapestry complex historical strands that cross time, space, ethnic, political, and linguistic divides. The audience that has gathered for these lectures is, however, particularly thirsty for Dr. Rodrigue's <coughs> insights. Because Seattle is home to one of the largest and culturally richest Sephardic communities in the country, and because we have so many Rodisli Jews among us, members of the wider Seattle communi community, be they Sephardic, Ashkenazi, or non-Jews, are unusually engaged in the history of Sephardic culture. We tend to appreciate, as the wider Jewish world and the wider world of Jewish studies do not always appreciate, the inherent importance and cultural intricacy of Sephardic history. As a community, we also shape this story. The Jewish Studies program at the University of Washington may be counted among very few programs in the country that has prioritized teaching and researching Sephardic culture and that has prioritized weaving the story of Sephardine into the wider story of Jewish, regional, and global histories. In his third and final lecture, Dr. Rodrigue will explore a topic almost entirely neglected by scholars, North African Jewry and the trauma of World War II. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Samuel and Althea Strom for their generosity to have made this possible and the Jewish Studies program. It's been a remarkable period that I've spent here. Uh, and as I keep on saying, uh, these lectures really, um, in, in many ways, are in dialogue with the audience and their enthusiasm and your enthusiasm. And therefore, I am getting uh, um, a, a lot of the uh, uh, sort of feedback from you and building upon it, and it's been a really fantastic experience. Thank you all again. In this last of my lecture series, I'm going to shift southward and to a part of the world, North Africa, which also was affected by many of the events of the Holocaust and became almost part of the eradication process, but did not quite. And that is a very interesting place and moment and time to uh, examine both the issues associated with the Holocaust, what we mean by that, and also how in a larger sense, in almost concentric circles, or if you wish, a sort of a spiral, different Jewish communities become, became part of this uh, overall broad story. Um, and um, we are going to be looking at all of North Africa, with the exception of Egypt, which remained under British rule in this particular period, and what happened to it during World War II, uh, and what conclusions that we can draw from it, and how we link this up to the earlier story about first the eradication of the Judeo-Spanish communities broadly. Uh, uh, described in my first lecture and second, a kind of more of a microcosm study of Rhodes that I did in my second lecture. In the Vanze conference of January 20 of 1942, preparing the discussions of the logistics of the final solution by the Nazi bureaucratic leadership, we have a curious statistic that has been observed by the scholars, the curious statistic of a list uh, 
for the final solution of the Jewish populations of Europe that were going to fall under the purview of this overall scheme. And of course, that was the whole document is full of euphemisms and code words, uh, euphemism, co euphemisms and code words for annihilation, destruction, but usually uh, couched in terms of a relocation, final solution, etc. We have under the rubric France, as far as demography is concerned, a statistic of 700,000. Whereas we know, of course, and the Nazis were perfectly aware, that the Jewish population of France was around 350,000, about half Jews who had been a French for long periods of time, half made up of Jews who had arrived in the last two generations or so. So when we look at the Van Zee statistics and when we look at what is meant by France, we immediately begin to ask the question of where is this extra number coming from? Again, it's kind of broadly defined, and it is, becomes quite clear that it includes the French colonies of North Africa. And we also have a sentence there which I think illuminates when I reread the protocols for the purposes of, uh, of this lecture. There is this kind of sentence there which I think illuminates pretty much what happens. And the sentence is the following. Um, the beginning of the individual larger evacuation actions will largely depend on military developments, which is precisely how, indeed, the process of uh, the, the treatment of Jews in these lands will, uh, the process that will be followed, uh, depending on the vagaries of World War II, on military and other kind of uh, development, and developments, and it is precisely uh, because of the limitations, that is say, of what the Germans could do at a crucial juncture that, in fact, these juries were not deported, uh, but did meet, in fact, almost all of the other actions, all, almost all of the other uh, oppressive measures in one way or another, whether through German rule or, li or Italian rule or uh, uh, French rule, uh, uh, the, some of the more uh, restrictive measures and oppressive measures of uh, World War II. Uh, but these events of the Holocaust did affect these communities profoundly, as I will make clear. Now, we have in popular imagination uh, a lot of echoes of North African Jewry during World War II, most notably the film Casablanca, of course. Uh, let's say we have North Africa, and we know something about Casablanca and spies. We also know about some of the other uh, um, sort of uh, echoes in popular m culture and movies and other things. The fall of Tobruk, Rommel, Montgomery, the Africa Corps, El Alamein, the major battles. But this is not just an empty canvas in which a European uh, story or battle is written, it also affected, because a lot of these movies and a lot of this popular representation uh, sort of almost negates into the background the local, but it affects all the local populations, all the local actors who are also significant elements. And among these are, of course, Arabs, Berbers, Jews, local Muslim governments, European settlers, and European colonial powers. That is to say, there are multi, multiple layers, all of them acting in North Africa. And it is through the European colonial powers that we have, of course, the arrival of World War II in North Africa. Let me lay the scene, first of all, of what North Africa is at, on the eve of World War II. I will br very uh, briefly describe to you uh, the uh, places and the uh, co particular colonial rules. Algeria in 1830 is, of course, conquered by France. Um, Tunisia uh, in 1881 becomes a protector to France. Uh, Morocco uh, in 1912. Spanish Morocco, of course, is, uh, Spain also has uh, northern Morocco. Tangier is an independent uh, uh, city. Italy will take uh, 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 Libya in 1911, and on the eve of World War II uh, in the, our period, there are about 200,000 Jews in Morocco, uh, 
about 120,000 Jews in, in, uh, uh, in Algeria, about 85,000 Jews in Tunisia, uh, and about 30,000 in Libya. Now, of course, that, that's kind of interesting because when I go back to the Vanze conference and I add up the numbers, it's clear that the Germans underestimated the number of Jews, but they were not that far off the mark uh, because this is a substantial Jewish population. And if under France we include the groups, we are very close to that number. Now, what and how does World War II affect these Jewish populations? First and foremost, it will affect them in very serious way through anti-Semitic legislation, anti-Jewish uh, legislation that is going to uh, be uh, enacted, most notably by the uh, Vichy government of France. You know, France, of course, falls to the Germans uh, in 1940. There is a, 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 an anti-French republic, new French national state under Marshal Pétain, which is created in 1940. Uh, the colonies of France remain under the rule of this uh, state. Um, and this state will, as, as you will see, enact all kinds of legislation that will affect the Jews. However, and I think as I'm laying the scene, this is going to be very significant in terms of what happens to the Jews. Um, we have a very uh, complicated situation as far as the three different countries are concerned, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Algeria is, and this is fascinating in terms of uh, the, the sort of ins and outs of colonial politics and the place of Jews and their place, in fact, in modernity as it affects them. Algeria is quite unique. It is, in fact, quite unique in the annals of colonialism in many ways because Algeria is not only a colony, but we have Algeria that is annexed outright to France and becomes an integral part of France with three départements. It's split up into three departments with, as the rest of France is split up and ruled as if it's an integral part of France. However, um, in, and this is uh, uh, from 1830 onwards, however, uh, not everybody who, who lives in Algeria, of course, has the same equal rights that, uh, that French citizens enjoy. The Muslim Arab population is disenfranchised, but the Jewish population, because of uh, a push coming from French Jews uh, in the 1860s, uh, was in 1870 on the famous Crémieux Decree, uh, had been granted French citizenship. So we have a very unique situation in Algeria whereby a non-European Jewry became part of the metropole in terms of equal rights and, and, and catapulted from an inferior position where it was under Arab rule for centuries, that is say tolerated with, equal, with, uh, with protected rights, but because of not having accepted Islam, not uh, 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 equal rights in terms of the general uh, Muslim population. They had been catapulted through, in fact, uh, the arrival of the colonial power through the position of having equal rights with the colonizers. And this, in some ways, had re uh, led to their uh, fundamental reorientation towards France and a rapid Frenchification or Gallicization process that took place with a very complex colonial uh, society where we have the settler, French uh, settlers and colonizing class that is living, that is arriving from France or other Mediterranean countries that uh, lives in Algeria. We have the Jews who are distinctive group who have equal rights to them, but who are of course much more moored in the local environment, but acting much more as intermediaries between the colonizer uh, and the local indigenous population of which they had been part, and an indigenous population of Muslims that remain disenfranchised because they're not yet deemed to have sufficiently, to use the, ter the French term, évolué or evolved to be part of uh, French uh, culture itself. So it's a very unique situation and one that is in fact fraught with problems for all the groups concerned, including the Jews, which fundamentally in the long run will erode their place in this society, but, but in an extreme case, which is going to be echoed in some ways in other colonizing, col, uh, colonization contexts. So Algeria, this is the scene. And on top of that, we have 
the settler French uh, uh, class that uh, wants, of course, uh, and a very large settler class, which, of course, wants to enjoy all the benefits of being at the top in a colony, being in an economic conflict with the Jewish population, which also is involved in the economy of that town, and therefore of, of that uh, country. And therefore, we have, in fact, a very long and bitter uh, anti-Semitic struggle against the Jews by the French colonial settler class in Algeria, which will spill over into Tunisia and Morocco as well, well from the end of the 19th century onwards, with deep roots into local anti-Semitism. At the time of the Dreyfus Affair, there are riots in Algeria. The first anti-Semitic deputies in the French parliament come from Algeria. This is a kind of a wound, as it were, that will feed anti-Semitism back into the metropole, will not only import it, but will, will feed it as well. So, in, in fact, in many ways, to understand French anti-Semitism, and I would argue, in fact, to open it up even more, in many ways, to understand elements of modern anti-Semitism, we do have to put the colonial uh, angle, uh, we, we do have to put the colonial picture back into the story, because uh, it becomes quite clear once we uh, begin to look at it from the optic of what's happening in North Africa, we have a very uh, dire and important uh, 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 and, and rather grave situation that is going on. Now, Morocco and, uh, and Tunisia are not necessarily going to follow the same uh, story altogether because they are not annexed outright by France. They're not part of France. They run as protectorates and because uh, it was considered by French officialdom and by the French col colonizing settler class that it had been a terrible mistake to give equal rights to the Jews. Uh, the Jews of Morocco and Tunisia are not, in fact, uh, made into French citizens. They are, remain under indigenous uh, uh, rulers, that is to say, the, uh, in Morocco, the Sultan of Morocco, the Bay of Tunisia, theoretically, for some of them, the ones who are more Frenchified, the ones who are more upper class, the possibilities of acquiring French citizenship are, are, are made easier, but there is no en masse naturalization of the Jews of Morocco and Tunisia. So we have here a, 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 a kind of complex story uh, which, which has some echoes, but it's not really exactly the same one as Algeria, and these countries have a much lesser in population settler class from Europe, which makes uh, the, the depth of European imported or, or locally grown because of the Europeans that have arrived sort of anti-Semitism much less strong and powerful in these countries. But this is just to set the scene. That is to say, by World War II, we have a situation of a colonizing uh, uh, ruling uh, group uh, a settled class, a group that is suspicious of uh, the Jews at best, inimical to the Jews at worst, that is waiting, in fact, to take back all the benefits that the last 50, 70, 100 years had uh, been given to the Jews. And then there is, to use the famous words of um, uh, uh, Charles Maurras, of course, the extreme French right wing uh, leader of Vichy, there's going to be the divine surprise, the divine surprise, that is say, the fall of France. Not that, the, that he was for the fall of France, but the overthrow of the French Republic and the establishment of a right wing authoritarian state in Vichy, France, that will replace liberty, equality, uh, fraternity with uh, a whole other set of values that will uh, uh, completely go back in terms of recreating a very different kind of socioeconomic and political structure. But it's colonialism that is the key because, as I said at the very beginning, it's through the, this conduit that all of a sudden we have uh, inevitably some of the events associated with World War II arriving in the colonies as well. Interestingly, the very first place that we begin to see this is a place I haven't talked about yet, which is Libya. Uh, 
Libya had been conquered since 1912 at around the same time as Rhodes, by the way. It's part of the same Italian empire that has Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, and uh, Libya. Um, the Jews there are, in Libya are not uh, Italian citizens, nevertheless, they do well under uh, the new Italian rule, but of course, Italian rule, there is a small population on the whole. Uh, they are not uh, a well-to-do community, but in the big cities of Tripoli and Benghazi, they are, in fact, uh, some of the commercial groups, and it is in this community uh, that, of course, we have a, some Italianization that does take place, and it is here that for the first time in 1938, just as we see in Rhodes, the same timetable that begins to be applied uh, to the Jews. That is to say, 1938 is the time of the famous anti-Semitic legislation in Italy of quotas being imposed on Jews, Jews being thrown off certain uh, uh, professions, limitations on their civil rights, and all kinds of other uh, restrictions. Um, it's interesting that in Libya, this is applied uh, on paper, but it is, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, the uh, Italian ruler, Italo Balbo, the governor general, uh, that believes that it's going to be too economically disruptive to apply fully, so he kind of makes it slightly more mild, and the Jews, until really the arrival of uh, the war situation in Italy, do not suffer too much from the anti-Semitic legislation. It is really, but it's a kind of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen under uh, in, uh, the war, under the fall of France in no North Africa. 1940, as I mentioned, and I, I will very briefly uh, inter uh, sort of do an overdue, overview of, of what is happening too. France is divided into two. As you know, in 1940, the southern part, which is a free state, um, although very much in the German orbit, uh, is uh, called Vichy France. And it continues, it uh, continues to rule over uh, the French colonies in this area. Now, it is the French anti-Semitic legislation that will have a direct impact on the colonial uh, situation. I will briefly identify, just very uh, uh, briefly, a few dates. On October 1940 in France, we have the famous Statut des Juifs, the Statute for the Jews, defining who is a Jew and limiting their uh, positions in society. In March of 1941, we have the, the, the General Commissariat for Jewish Question, the Commissariat General aux Questions Juives, that is created that will oversee what happens to the Jews. In June of 1941, we have a second stat, uh, Statut des Juifs, a second Statute of Jews, much more restrictive, limiting the place of Jews in commerce and the professions that is passed. In July of 1941, we have uh, the so-called Aryanization program, that is the act of looting, what I would, we, we would now call looting, that is say, taking over and confiscation of Jewish property that is taking place. In November 1941, we have a countrywide Jewish council to represent French Jewish interests, the UGIF d'Union Générale Israélite de France, the, the General uh, Union of French Jews, that has created a kind of a Judenrat, a Jewish council that we will see in Eastern Europe that is supposed to represent and act as a conduit. And finally, in summer 1942, in the face of German demands, French, the France handing over foreign Jews or foreign citizen Jews uh, to the Germans for deportations to Auschwitz and to the East. So we have October 40 to November, uh, uh, summer of 1942, a set of anti-Semitic legislation that first, like everywhere else in Europe, affected by the series of events we call the Holocaust that follow a certain pattern, defining who is a Jew, uh, restricting their place in society, eventually taking over their property and separating them from the rest of society en route to eventual deportation. This is a, a script that will be followed in almost all of those countries, whether conquered directly by Germany uh, or not. When it's conquered by Germany directly, it's all accelerated, done with great speed, although there are some variations there, but it's done with, with kind of an extreme, uh, extreme measures. In other countries that are in the German orbit, like Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, or indeed Vichy France, they are done by local authorities, but not with German bidding, but because, in fact, 
local uh, rulers that were in sympathy with some of the anti-Semitic aims, but not necessarily in sympathy with necessarily extermination. That's a different story. Many of them didn't even know about it, but in sympathy with limiting the place of Jews uh, will enact. So we have, in fact, a kind of a German anti-Semitic clock that is set throughout Europe, but it is at different places according to where the Germans are. And it is this clock, in some ways, that is also going to affect these colonies. In Algeria, in fact, it is the most extreme and immediate implementation of these policies. Why? Because, in fact, paradoxically, in a place where the Jews had benefited most from the benefits of French citizenship, they had the most to lose, and because it was an integral part of France, uh, the laws of the French state would be applied 100% because it's considered as part of France. And France, by the way, had obliterated the local Muslim leadership and rule. It is being ruled from prefects sent from France uh, with the local people who are voting, so there is with local French uh, citizens who are voting. So there is, in fact, no buffer which will, in fact, exist in Morocco and in Tunisia in the, in the shape of uh, local uh, Muslim rulers. So we have, I don't need to belabor the point, we have um, one of the first steps, which is not only the application of the Statut des Juifs, which is the Jewish limitation of the, of the, of the place of Jews, but right after that, before that, the, the most important demand of anti-Semites in France um, and in North Africa for the last two generations, that is say, the repeal of the Crémieux Decree of 1870 that had given Jews French citizenship. So in 1870, we have the taking away of citizenship retroactively of Jews that had become French. And we have a whole set of uh, similar sort of actions that are going to take place as in France, the definition of who's a Jew, exclusion from public service, courts, media, theater, army, teaching corps. In the next two years, we have the, the local representation of the French commissariats in, in, in arriving, the Aryanization office, the confiscation of Jewish property, uh, quotas in universities, uh, exclusion from schools, and, e and indeed even some local labor camps where uh, 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 Algerian Jewish soldiers that had been conscripted are not returned to their communities, but are put in uh, under harsh or forced labor uh, command under the rule of the Foreign Legion uh, in France. So we have a very harsh situation where a lot of people you lose their jobs in Algeria, lose their positions, lose their uh, livelihoods. Now, in Morocco, in fact, because the Jews had not entered the French orbit as much, because the France is relatively late in arriving in 1912, and also because they remain subject to the local sultan, there are very few people in French, col 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 very few Jews in French colonizing structures of the regime that stand to lose. So on the whole, Moroccan Jews, the, the restrictions are applied in the administrative structures. It does affect the Jews, but it does not affect them as much. For example, the Jews remain, uh, uh, had been uh, under um, the school system of the French Jewish school system of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, uh, and they were not in French schools. So they had not been uh, thrown, they, didn't, they weren't thrown out of French schools as they were in Algeria where uh, the Alliance was not present as the public Jewish uh, day school uh, system. Uh, so they actually, uh, as a result, uh, were somewhat uh, preserved from uh, some of the extremes of this uh, legislation, not because it wasn't applied, uh, but because, of course, it, 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 the people it was designed, it was targeting were not necessarily there in large numbers. However, there, is, uh, there are large numbers of um, hard labor camps in Morocco uh, where um, the Jews are, are uh, many foreign Jewish refugees uh, who are arriving from Europe uh, are going to be uh, incarcerated. There are about 30 concentration camps under harsh labor uh, conditions. Sometimes they don't go into these camps, they can leave uh, from Casablanca or other places as it were, but very, uh, sometimes they are greeted by the local Jewish community, but very frequently they will end up under very uh, difficult uh, uh, positions. Um, uh, those who had some sort of transit visa 
for, for example, the US or whatever, could leave. Others who were stranded there were then put uh, to, to work in, in uh, very uh, difficult uh, uh, conditions. In Tunisia, what we have uh, in, as of the fall of France, we have um, uh, 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 the same anti-Semitic legislation, but the situation is slightly more complicated because Italy has aims on Tunisia, and Italy has about 5,000 Jewish uh, Italian citizens, and Italy, of course, is an ally of the Germans. It has uh, its own citizens among the Jews living in Tunisia, so when the French uh, attempt some of the anti-Semitic legislation, one of the great paradoxes yet again of an ally of the Nazis, the, the French will, uh, the Italians will object and the French kind of go, they, since they can't apply to everybody, then they kind of don't implement it fully. The French uh, uh, leader, Jean-Pierre Esteva, the governor uh, general, will uh, uh, also not fully implement this legislation and held up most of his clauses because also he had to do with the local Muslim rulers, the, uh, the, bays, the Bay of Tunis, who is actually now beginning to act as the protector of his own citizens, that is to say, of his own subjects, that is to say, uh, Tunisian Jews itself. So there is some implementation of this, uh, uh, of this action, of, of this legislation, but it is uh, not as extreme as we have in uh, Algeria. So, uh, full anti-Semitic legislation in Algeria, moderate implementation in Morocco and Tunisia, but basically the undoing of what North African Jewry up until then had thought was the prescriptive path towards modernity as far as they were concerned, which was becoming modern citizens and very frequently in these cases, in fact, in the great majority, believing that the future lay in France, fully committed to becoming citizens of France and becoming Europeans. There are some who objected, there are some uh, sort of gradations in all of this, but that is in fact the ethos and the mood of all of the three communities, and all of a sudden there is this enormous shock of this being, the, the rug being pulled from under them by that. However, as we will see a little bit later on, one way they got around that uh, uh, was to also believe that almost all of this was done through German bidding and not through uh, indigenous, let's say, local uh, or French-inspired uh, uh, action itself. So anti-Semitic legislation following in many ways uh, uh, the, the same pattern as we see everywhere else with different gradations. The second big impact is military operations. Military operations that are going to affect the Jews uh, and that will lead, of course, in some cases to extreme uh, and very grave danger. The first place is Libya. Libya, of course, is um, uh, a site of war. Balbo, who is the governor general, will die in an airplane accident in June 1940. The Jews are, of course, accused of this. In December of 1940, the British attack from Egypt. They occupy, uh, uh, they, they manage to control, they, Benghazi falls, this whole area is controlled by the British. Um, the Germans sent in troops by Rommel uh, uh, to help the Italians repeal them. And we will have for the next period of one to two years, and constant going back and forth of the frontier with le several battles, and the, the Jews caught in between, expelled sometimes to Tripoli, expelled from Tripoli uh, under Benghazi. I won't go into the great into great details. However, what we really begin to see are, as the situation gets uh, harsher and harsher, Italians uh, establishing camps for Jews south of Tripoli, the famous Giado camp uh, with hundreds and eventually thousands of Jews arriving there, and finally, uh, extreme interpretation of uh, attempt to limit uh, anti uh, the place of Jews uh, in the economy, extreme interpretation of the anti-Semitic laws um, from June to December of 1942, um, uh, and even uh, one of the uh, very first steps towards deportations, which we saw in Salonika already uh, and in other places, a decree 
that is uh, to um, uh, drafting of Jews, 18 to 45 male Jews, uh, for forced labor battalions. There is a labor camp established again south of Tripoli. Um, but uh, in, uh, in, because by uh, January of 1943, the British uh, uh, conquer Libya, uh, we have, uh, in spite of enormous suffering of the Jews of Libya, uh, the uh, stopping just in time of the full implementation of uh, these policies. We have um, the major turning point is Operation Torch, which is the Allied invasion of November 8 of 1942, uh, which is Anglo-American forces that are arriving uh, in this period. Um, and uh, we, uh, this is one of the very first, of course, repealing of uh, the, uh, uh, both the Germans and an attempt to kind of uh, uh, come from the south, as it were, to overtake Europe. Morocco is relatively easily conquered, but in Algeria, uh, there is quite a bit of fighting, by the way, of course, the ones who are fighting are the local French who are fighting uh, the Allies in these uh, areas. And in uh, 1942, uh, in this period, there is an uprising in Algiers, uh, an uprising by uh, 377 resistance fighters, 315 of whom are Jews of Algeria, in, uh, in a full... Uh, in, just before the arrival of the uh, uh, Americans uh, in Algiers, and they took control of the city in November 7th to 8th, um, and eventually the resistance will hold firm, even though the Americans are delayed, and uh, they arrive. However, much to the dismay of the Jewish population, this is, by the way, again, something that specialists have studied, uh, but has not yet entered this sort of general uh, 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 sort of consciousness, uh, the um, arriving American forces do not repeal or have the French repeal the anti-Semitic legislation because they're very worried about, um, uh, even though they're fighting uh, uh, the Vichy uh, power, they don't want really Vichy to be, they kind of are pretending they're neutral. They don't want Vichy to become their full-fledged enemies in France. So they actually deal with local rulers who are in fact themselves uh, anti-Semites themselves, but who um, are now switching sides. And uh, the uh, American uh, representative, Robert Murphy, Roosevelt's personal representative, does not act. There is going to be a big outcry eventually in the US when in fact the anti-Semitic legislation is full, continues to be implemented in terms of, of, of limiting, much to the uh, dismay of the, of the Jews themselves. And we have um, uh, eventually uh, uh, the w uh, waiting until the arrival of uh, de Gaulle and the switching over of the local French uh, 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 sort of forces that we have uh, the uh, full uh, uh, repeal of almost all of that legislation and the reintroduction uh, of the Kremio decree, that is to say the naturalization of the Jews. Uh, but that will wait for quite a while, and Americans will wait until really uh, it becomes untenable politically at home to actually do anything about this kind of issue because they believe it's an internal French affair and they are not going to become involved. Now, Tunisia, however, is where we see the most extreme measures as far as the Jews are concerned, uh, and the most extreme situation as far as the Jewish communities. And the reason for that is simple. It is, of course, the one place where the German army will be there in force. The Wehrmacht arrives because, as you can see in Operation Torch on November 9th, 1942, before the Allies can reach Tunis, the Germans arrive in Tunis. Uh, they arrive to reinforce the Italians and to stop. Uh, and until December, there are going to be lots of air attacks. There's this kind of a, uh, a, a, a precarious hold. The Germans will not touch the local French protective regime, nor the, uh, nor the, um, uh, the, the local configuration forces. Uh, they will also, however, lose the cooperation of a lot of other factors like local Italians and uh, Muslims and others who had thought that this was going to inaugurate independence by being uh, um, harsh and unyielding. But it's very interesting that when the Germans arrive in Tunisia, 
they will begin exactly according to the German clock that I identified, immediately begin to implement their regular legislation of, uh, of, uh, that follows exactly what they did everywhere else. They take the first steps only against the Jews only two weeks after they arrive, November the 23rd. They will typically, this is the old way, it always began arresting four members, the top members of the Jewish community. Um, they will be the French consul and the local French. There are too many, there are many uh, sort of buffer uh, groups there. The local uh, protectors and others will intervene and they will uh, be released. But they will, of course, they were always released in other places as well because they ratchet up the, 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 the pressure. December 6th, the Germans will dissolve the communal structure and we create a new board made of nine people that are asked to recruit 2,000 Jews for forced uh, labor. Uh, and we have, in fact, the creation of a Jewish council, which is, in fact, an exa exact uh, replica of a Judenrat that becomes the intermediaries between the Germans and uh, the, uh, 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 the Jews. The Jew they will uh, arrest several dozen Jewish communal leaders when the no right number of people are not delivered for mass labor. They will threaten mass arrests, they, uh, threaten to blow up the local synagogues, and uh, eventually, in fact, this local council will organize a whole system of getting Jews into forced labor and putting them into camps, which is in fact the way that a lot of Jewish councils elsewhere uh, uh, worked. We have 5,000 Jews in forced labor camps, the most important outside Bizerte here, but in many, many parts, uh, over 30 locations in Tunisia. There's some sort of class conflict, of course, that goes into this situation because the poor Jews are the ones that are selected by this Jewish council, uh, and a lot of people kind of pay them their way out. By the way, a, a, a wonderful um, uh, sort of snapshot of these um, labor camps is in Albert Memmi's, of course, The Pip Pillar of Salt. Uh, that is a wonderful novel written right after the war uh, by the most famous French Tunisian Jewish uh, uh, writer, where he himself, of course, was uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in one of these camps. And we basically have labor camps that are in occupation. However, uh, this is a war zone. Um, in spite of the fact that 26 Jewish political activists are deported, flown, some of them, by aircraft to German uh, camps in Europe, German running camps in Europe, none of whom, by the way, will return. They will be killed either in Auschwitz or in Bergen-Belsen or elsewhere. Um, there is, uh, 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 apart from uh, these, uh, there is not enough time to uh, organize an actual mass deportation across the Mediterranean. It could be done in roads because it was a small community, required a few barges, it was the right time strategically for the Germans to do. It was very hard to do with tens of thousands of Jews, with the allies at the gates of Tunis. Uh, um, instead, what we have eventually is a situation of deterioration, of the total anarchy, random attacks on Jews, massive confiscation and looting of Jewish property by average German army soldiers. There's very thin presence of the SS in all of this, but a rapid uh, sort of taking over of a lot of property demands to communities all over the place, like uh, in the island of Jerba uh, and Sfax and elsewhere, to hand over all of their uh, uh, communal properties or at least accumulated wealth. So there is this situation of camps, a Jewish council, the German army, uh, or Jews already living separately, looting, but uh, in fact, no actual deportations. In this case, the Mediterranean will save the Jews. That is to say, the Mediterranean as a barrier will prevent the hooking up of the local community to the railway system, which is the lifeblood of the Holocaust extermination process. The roads, Jews could be hooked up that way through Athens when they were deported because they were uh, about 1800. Um, they could arrive uh, 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 relatively untouched. Uh, uh, it was a small group. Uh, here, uh, it, it could not be done. The railways were missing. 
when we look at this situation, what are we to make of this? How do we analyze the various things I've described? I've described first the implementation of anti-Semitic anti legislation that comes from first, first and foremost from France with various degrees of severity that are going to be uh, uh, implemented. We have economic spoliation, confiscation of property, uh, looting. We have camps, uh, whether incarceration camps in Morocco of refugees or labor battalions or extreme uh, labor uh, uh, harsh conditions. We have, in fact, acts of resistance. That is, say, resistance, a Jewish uprising, essentially a Jewish uprising in Algiers. Uh, uh, we have uh, almost, almost all of the elements except, of course, the crucial element which eventually destroyed uh, other Jewish communities elsewhere, which is the actual deportations uh, themselves. So this whole period constitutes for these juries a massive trauma. Um, belief in their place in these societies already shaken, uh, belief in France shaken by both Jews and, 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 and Arabs. First of all, Jews, uh, some of them would interpret, of course, what is happening as perhaps German imposed, but they do see the actual uh, local anti-Semitic implementation. But secondly, as far as the local groups are concerned, most notably the Arabs and other Muslim groups like Berbers who are very strong, you begin to realize there is a kind of growing realization that indeed the colonizing ruler France could be defeated, was defeated, was defeated by the Germans, which means that independence movements against colonialism are going to get uh, extremely powerful right after uh, World War uh, II. There is going to be a, a rapid increase in nationalism in almost all of these areas, which uh, will follow this enormous turning of, of this kind of established order uh, upside down. And, of course, there is going to be, especially in places like Tunisia and Morocco, a great increase in receptivity to Zionism, which is a very important moment in terms of a turning point as far as World War II is concerned. Because it, as far as these Jews are concerned, it, un uh, it undermines the uh, faith in the European model of emancipation that had been preached to it by uh, uh, the uh, ruling uh, French uh, 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 elite and, in fact, French Jews and, in fact, indeed, the assimilated elements among their own uh, groups. There is also an increase in polarization. And here I need to take one step back and really, again, put this moment of trauma at a long secular trend, as part of a long secular trend. If we take one step back in all of this, and we look at 1830 and 1840, and we take the story up till 1945-48, we have, through the arrival of European colonialism in this area, a massive reorientation of the Jews, in many ways away from their local moorings, in terms of their elite, in terms of their imagination, in terms of their overall orientation, in terms of the language of culture they use, in terms sometimes of their religious practice, but in terms also of their economic interest, and in reaction to a situation of being second-class citizens for long, long periods of time uh, under Muslim rule, where there was a coexistence, there was a modus vivendi, but there were clear limitations to what could be, uh, 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 what could be uh, acceptable and what would not be acceptable. And then with the arrival of the European power, the possibility of emancipation and equality and a different form of uh, uh, polity and existence linked very strongly to economic, improvement of the mercantile groups, 
and making of middle classes, which stood to gain and did gain and benefited enormously from acting as intermediaries between Europe and the indigenous populations, but in the process getting into a massive uh, uh, conflict with other colonizing settler class, uh, colonizing European groups. So a complex situation, but a situation that actually had destabilized already even before World War II, the place of the Jews in those societies, where the Jew had now become increasingly associated, as far as the indigenous groups are concerned, with the colonizer, and not any more native. The Jew becoming part of the foreign, and not the local. And we have, however, on top of that, when we have the arrival of World War II, the arrival of radical anti-Semitic legislation, the uh, importation by the corrosive presence of, uh, uh, of uh, a European war by the colonizers, of almost, almost all of the equation of Europe, bringing the Jews almost to the edge of destruction, but not quite we see a process in the long-term basis of the Holocaust as a kind of a major turning point, as a signpost that further destabilizes the place of Jews in almost all of these societies. I think for a long time, we have uh, focused on Jews in Muslim lands, especially of North Africa and elsewhere, only through the eyes of the Arab-Israeli conflict of 1948. But we have another history that goes back at least a century prior to that. So 1939 to, uh, well, we could say 1938 with the Italian anti-Semitic legislation, till 1943, which is the end of the story for 33, in some, some, in some places 44, but 43, the, which is the end of the story as far as North Africa is concerned, is uh, itself uh, a, uh, a major, uh, 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 moment here that is not necessarily foreshadowing 1948 or 1952 or 55, but is itself part of that long-term evolution. Now, in these three lectures, to conclude, I've examined uh, the Jews, Judeo-Spanish communities of the Balkans, uh, and Jews of North Africa, Jews considered non-European, whatever that means, and actually in the Southeastern European case, flagrantly problematic even more than other places. Um, I've examined and given you only a few snapshots of a very complicated story. I've really only touched sort of certain highlights. I've also tried to tell the story itself, since it wasn't known. I haven't only analyzed it, but I've tried to tell the story and build on it uh, some interpretation. And I observed three main paths. Um, one is a mirror image of what, ha what happens in the Ashkenazi heartland happening in the Judeo-Spanish core communities. Very similar. The same and sometimes even higher rate of destruction. When you look at the great communities of Salonika and Sarajevo and, and Monastir and Bitola, and we, we see uh, Belgrade, all of these communities and what happens and deportations, it's a story that joins exactly the same story that we are used to in the general Holocaust narratives with the same dislocation and destruction of historic core areas of modern Jewish civilization in Europe. The second one, which was a transition one, is part of that one, and that was the second part of my story, uh, the second lecture, which was Rhodes, which was taken as a representative as a kind of microcosm, not only for the multiplicity of the history of these Sephardic communities, the kind of complex kind of background, but there we, be, we saw a process of destruction that joins that of the Judeo-Spanish and Ashkenazi heartlands, but we had already the introduction there of the twist of colonialism, the Italian presence, what that had done for the 20, 30 years prior, how they, even in this small island, this small community, the Jewish community had turned towards Italianization 
only to be left in the, uh, in the lurch in the final, uh, uh, at the final moments uh, and to be uh, plucked off from there uh, and destroyed. And last, um, we see the mass implementation with, in terms of, uh, with various uh, degrees of certainly bureaucratic anti-Semitism um, and even further than that with the Juden right now as we're in, in, in Tunis, kind of the further uh, extreme of that, uh, uh, elements of that, uh, the implementation of this, uh, the, almost all of the aspects of anti-Semitic legislation that preceded deportations in North Africa arriving in the natural lands of colonialism proper, that is the, the, the first areas to be colonized in the modern period, uh, 1830 in Algeria and other places, the cl closest areas uh, that are colonized, but then the uh, final uh, moments of uh, being saved both by the sea and the arrival of the uh, allies, which is in fact the first arrival, historically speaking. Remember, this is 1942 is Operation Torch, it's 1944 that's going to be D-Day. So in terms of the time frame, we are actually in much, much earlier story. But I think and I hope that you have seen that the period of the Holocaust when it comes to Sephardi juries of Southeastern Europe is concerned or when it comes indeed to Jews of North Africa in general, the period of the Holocaust is not uh, just a minor episode in Jewish history or uh, world history, but it is a, a, an episode that has its own weight, that has its own importance, and that really links up in ways that uh, I've only been able to summarize very, very briefly to multiple, multiple stories of Jewish and non-Jewish histories uh, uh, throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.